I love my mom because she has shown me every day how to live a life of Christ. My name is Caroline and I am the Associate Youth Director and I love my mom because she is always so encouraging and supportive and has always been there for me in everything that I do. I love my mom because she is so caring and her heart is filled with so much love. She always checks up on us to make sure we're okay because she always wants us to be happy. I'm very thankful for her. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Love you. Hey, Mom. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. You are literally my rock, and you've made me the person I am today. Thank you for all you do. You're really the best we could ever ask for. My mom, because she's a great cook and listens to my problems. I love my mom because she's supportive of me, and she does fun things with me. I love my mom because she's always there for me and she makes the best food. We love Marcella. She has cool hair. I like Jacob. I love my mom because she's a really hard worker and she's a great role model. I love my mom because she loves me no matter what and makes great cinnamon rolls. I love my mom because she is nice, caring, funny, and good at cooking. This is Reverend Steve Schofield, and I'd like to welcome you this morning to Dahlonega United Methodist Church for our Sunday morning worship. I'm delighted that you've chosen to worship with us this morning, and we are excited uh, to go to our Lord and Savior in spirit and truth. Now let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to worship you, to be in your house to may our hearts go to you. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit as we hear your word read, as we hear your songs of praise. May our hearts be filled with joy as we draw closer to you in the act of worship. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
time for our, our prayer time, and uh, I want to thank all of you all who prayed uh, this week for my mother, and she's uh, recuperating from her surgery, and um, it was nice. I was able to go see her for the first time in about four or five weeks, and uh, I want to thank you all, and I know other others of you have been able to have some surgeries that have been postponed, and... Um, our prayers are with you right now. And so uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are we're grateful to be worshiping you today. We're grateful to be in communion with you and with our brothers and sisters all across this community and this nation and this world. And Lord, um, our hope is all in you and we do see some light at the end of your tunnel. It's going to be difficult, Lord. We're going to have to persevere and to focus on you. But uh, if we'll do that and then we'll work together and care for each other, uh, we can get through this time in our world uh, knowing you and drawing closer to you, Lord. And so I, I do want to lift up all those who are going through health problems right now. And I know that's very difficult. Um, it's a difficult time to be doing that. Some with the, the COVID-19, others have other health problems that they're struggling with. Uh, I want to lift up those who have um, lost people in their family and are grieving in a time of great isolation. I want to lift up those who are facing uncertain job situations and um, help help you all to know that the Lord is with you and that we're with you and that we'll, we are united in this. And um, I also want to lift up those who are just waiting for things to get reopened so that they can be a light in this community and help those who are struggling. And, and I thank many of you all who have reached out uh, to our church and to our community and look for ways to help. And uh, Lord, in all these things, uh, we give you thanks. We see glimpses of your light and of your truth everywhere we look. And we pray for revival in, in and through this, that uh, the humans across the world will come out of this humbled, not use this as a time of division or triumphalism, but of humility and turn to you. And we thank you for all your blessings and the ways that we see and have experienced your great love and your grace and your and your outpouring to us. And we pray this in the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. God bless you.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 John, 1 John chapter 4. I will begin with verse 7. Hear now the word of God. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must, must also love their brother and sister. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, I ask that you fill me. There is a word that you need to speak today. So move me aside and speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the one who is risen. Amen. I grew up in a small town a small southern town. Many of my sermons talk about that small town, about my life, my parents, brothers and sisters, my family. Growing up on many acres with cows and a horse, dogs, chickens, a garden, vegetables and flowers. I lived in a community in which almost everyone was related to each other. My grandparents lived in the central part of the community. And I've told you this before, they owned what is called a filling station, our gas station today. My grandfather had the gas station my grandmother had a store, and they were the central part of this community. My aunt and uncle, my cousins, lived just down the bend. I had other cousins that lived in other parts, just down the road from the central location of this store that my grandparents owned. In that small community, for the most part, it was primarily white. However, not very far from that, there was a road called New Hope Road. And down that road is where my 
black brothers and sisters lived. That's where the New Hope Church was that I've spoken of often. A church that my parents took me to on many occasions. I was born in 1968. The South was just becoming desegregated. There was no longer a black school and a white school, but we were together. Although we were together, it was very common during that time to hear the N-word thrown around like it was nothing. In many ways, it was perhaps the worst thing you could call someone. I often spent my summers at my grandparents. I, I pretty much lived with them in the summer while mom and daddy worked. And at that filling station, the old men would gather and talk about the daily events. My, my grandfather would often do a little bit of politicking. They played checkers, chew tobacco, drank Coke, had a few side bets going. Every now and then there would be a mess of catfish caught and there would be a wonderful fish fry. It was there that I think I first heard the N-word. Didn't really know what it was, but it was real easy that when the N-word was used and a black man came by, what was meant by that? I still didn't understand. Had a cousin who was about five years older than I was and his favorite thing to do would be to torment me and call me that n-word. I still didn't other, understand fully other than it was the worst thing that you could call me and I didn't even know why. I wasn't old enough to understand why I didn't want to be black. I remember coming home one day, a little too big for my britches, getting mad at my brother and calling him that N-word because it was the worst thing that I could call someone. Surprisingly, my mother didn't jump off the, the deep end and give me a spanking, which she probably should have. Instead, she brought down the dictionary. She made me look up that N word. Nowhere in that definition did it say a black man or a black woman or a black child. But instead, it was reserved to, for someone of low class, of trash, of dirt. Someone who was not worthy. That night, my parents read 1 John to me. They read to me the very end of 1 John 4, which is what I read to you today. Of course, I read the whole, almost all of, of 1 John to you. I 
I was little. But yet I understood, probably better then than I did as an adult. You see, there was a, a song that we sang in Sunday school. You've sang it. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I realized in that moment through looking up what that word, that N word means. And then listening to what John has to say. That yes, indeed, Jesus loves all of his children. I could sit here and I could tell you that we've got a problem. That we really are no better now than in 1968 when I was born. And oh, by the way, the very next year, Martin Luther King Jr. would be assassinated. I could tell you exactly what John said. Don't be afraid. I could try with all my might to convince you that God is real. I could try everything that I can to tell you that we should treat a brother and sister no matter the color, no matter the religion. No matter where they live, no matter if they have money or don't have money, what kind of job, but that we should treat everyone the same. We should treat them with love as God loves us. But here's the cold hard truth and the cold hard fact. Yes, my parents did an incredible job of raising me to understand the love of Jesus Christ. We didn't say the N-word in my home. It was not allowed. I learned that that day. Mama and Daddy had black friends. I had black friends. And I loved them, still do. I remember working with one at the Economy Drug Store, a black young man who was a year older than I was, and we had an incredible friendship. But he went his way after high school and I went mine. I think of him often and wonder what happened to him. Yes, I could sit here and I could try to convince you to buy into the words that, that you've heard in the scripture today, that, that you heard in John. But the one thing that mom and daddy were afraid of, believe it or not, they were afraid of the power of the Holy Spirit. The other thing that happened in the 70s is you had a charismatic movement that was going on during that time. You had the hippie generation. 
And so the problem was is that you had this new form of worship that was beginning. It was what we see today as contemporary worship. Mom and Daddy, were, I believe, were a little afraid of that. They were afraid that it looked too much like the hippie movement as well. And so when a group came to our Southern Baptist Church, a mission team, and they got up and they played music that didn't sound like the old hymns, and they began to get up and give their testimony, Mom and Daddy were not sure of that. I began to feel the stirring of the Holy Spirit. But Daddy was a little afraid of that. I get it. I, I do. I understand why he felt the way he did. That was also during the time that... Uh, you had the Mansons and all of that had just, all of that had just happened. And so that was going on. You had people who were joining cults. And mom and daddy just didn't know what was safe. I can, I can convince you as best I can to love your brother and sister. But until you are willing to stop being afraid of the power of the Holy Spirit, we're not going to get anywhere. That is the only way that a person can truly be changed. My prayer started by asking for the Holy Spirit to come on me, to empower me. I don't know why in the world we are afraid of that. All through Acts, we have story after story after story of the power of the Holy Spirit and what happens when that happens, when the Spirit comes on a person. One of my favorite stories is of Stephen. He's facing adversity. He's facing his death. But yet he calls on that power of the Holy Spirit. And he is able to boldly proclaim the gospel. And at the end, he looks up to heaven. And Jesus Christ, who is supposed to be sitting on the right hand of God the Father, stands up. He stands up to welcome Stephen, who is about to enter into the kingdom of God. Paul, time after time, faces Jews that don't want to hear about Jesus Christ, don't want to hear about the way. This is the same Paul who persecuted Jesus. But yet on the road to Damascus, Jesus found him. And told him, I'm going to use you to bring the way, the good news to the Gentiles. Time after time, we hear in Acts that the power of the Spirit came on Paul. And he was able to bring the gospel, the good news. He called it the way. At times he was beaten. At times he was thrown in prison. But even locked up behind bars, there were those who hurt him. And because of the power of the Holy Spirit, they changed. Paul is on a boat. He's headed to Rome. 
He knows that they are going to be shipwrecked. And yet God tells him, actually Jesus tells him in that moment, everybody needs to stay on the boat. If everybody will stay on the boat, the power of the Holy Spirit will protect everyone. Those who believe and those who don't believe. The power of the Holy Spirit is that great. And even though some threw lifeboats over, there were those who by the power of the Holy Spirit heard Paul say, no, you got to stay on the boat. And so they cut the lines. And everyone on the boat stayed, even though the boat was dashed against the rocks, even though they had to swim to dry land. The power of the Holy Spirit was on every man and woman on that boat. Well, there were no women, just men. And they all made it to safety. Mama and Daddy gave me the foundations. They taught me right from wrong. They taught me about God the Father and God the Son. And that was the beginning. And many of you right now who are hearing this, you know about God the Father and God the Son, but you're afraid of that power of the Holy Spirit. That makes all the difference in the world. So why does the Spirit come on you? Stephen knew. Paul knew. Peter knew. John knew. When we ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to come on us, we are able to preach the gospel. We are able to tell our neighbors what it means to love God. That when you love God, you love your brother and sister, no matter the color, no matter what they believe. The two men who killed Ahmad Alberry did not believe in God. They might say they did, but according to John, if you truly know God and you only know God through the power of the Holy Spirit, that he, he says that, then you love your brother and sister. If you do not love your brother and sister, then you are a liar. Folks, I'm telling you right now, if you hear this, if you are listening, And you know you do not love your brother or sister as God loves them. You are a liar. It's time to know of the Holy Spirit. We are moving toward Pentecost. It's the last Sunday in the month. It doesn't matter what the government can do. The government can desegregate all it wants to. The government can make laws all it wants to. That's not going to change anything. The only way that our world will be changed is by you. By you asking for the Holy Spirit to come on you now. To change you. So that you may deeply love the way that Jesus loves. And the reason why the Spirit will do that is so that you can go out and you can tell others, just as Stephen did, just as Paul did, just as I am doing today. If that father and son had known the power of the Holy Spirit, they would not have done what they did. We can do this. Delonica United Methodist Church, we can do this. I want to see this revival. I want to see this awakening. 
I want to fill it through the very power of the Holy Spirit. When you get this power, when it comes on you, you will testify. Because there's a brother and sister, a father, a mother, a son, a daughter. Just like the McMichaels. And until we are willing to call on the power of the Holy Spirit and be courageous enough to preach the gospel to everyone, we will not change what happened. We will not be able to love Ahmaud Albury the way that Jesus has called us to love. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I know for many of you that was a difficult sermon. If you're tired of listening to the Ahmad Alberry story, you need to pray. All of us do. And so as our benediction today, um, I'd like to offer that prayer. I'd like to ask in this moment for you to join with me on your knees. And ask the power of the Holy Spirit to come on you. To change you fully. So that you may testify of God's great love. Also want to let you know that we are, I'm going to be starting uh, a study on the Holy Spirit. It's using Jack Deere's new book, Why I'm Still Surprised by the Power of the Spirit. And we'll be starting that on Wednesdays. At 6.30. It'll be a Zoom. If you'd like to be a part of that study. To hear more about what, who the Holy Spirit is. How to get the Holy Spirit. We're going to be talking about subjects that are somewhat taboo these days. And that's sad. We're going to be talking about healing. Casting out demons. Feeding the 5,000. Ending racism. We're going to be talking about all of those. And yes, more importantly, we're going to be talking about what it truly means to love Jesus Christ. So I'll offer this prayer now. Holy God, in front of you at this moment is a son and a daughter who desires the very power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Lord, forgive us, for we have sinned. Sinned against you and sinned against our brothers and sisters. Forgive us, Lord. Send down your grace and forgiveness on us. Send down the fire of the Holy Spirit on those now, on us, on me. On the one who is on his knees, her knees at this very moment, Lord. Empower us, Lord, with the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we will rise and we will testify to the goodness of God. 
for great is our Lord, greatly to be praised. Great is your love, and great is our love. Lord, we make this prayer in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's children said, Amen.